Section 16 The Critique of Pure Reason by Immanuel Kant Transcendental Doctrine of Elements Part 2nd Transcendental Logic First Division Transcendental Analytic Book 2 Transcendental Doctrine of the Faculty of Judgment or Analytic of Principles Chapter 2 System of All Principles of the Pure Understanding Section 3 Systematic Representations of All Synthetical Principles of the Pure Understanding 4. The Postulates of Empirical Thought The Postulates of Empirical Thought 1. That which agrees with the formal conditions, parens, intuition and conception, and parens, of experience, is possible. 2. That which coheres with the material conditions of experience, parentheses, sensation, and parentheses, is real. 3. That whose coherence with the real is determined according to universal conditions of experience is, parentheses, exists, and parentheses, necessary. Explanation The categories of modality possess this peculiarity that they do not in the least determine the object, or enlarge the conception to which they are annexed as predicates, but only express its relation to the faculty of cognition. Though my conception of a thing is in itself complete, I am still entitled to ask whether the object of it is merely possible, or whether it is also real, or, if the latter, whether it is also necessary. But hereby the object itself is not more definitely determined in thought, but the question is only in what relation it, including all its determinations, stands to the understanding and its employment in experience, to the empirical faculty of judgment, and to the reason of its application to experience. For this very reason, too, the categories of modality are nothing more than explanations of the conceptions of possibility, reality, and necessity, as employed in experience, and at the same time, restrictions of all the categories to empirical use alone, not authorizing the transcendent employment of them. For if they are to have something more than a merely logical significance, and to be something more than a mere analytical expression of the form of thought, and to have a relation to things in their possibility, reality, or necessity, they must concern possible experience and its synthetical unity, in which alone objects of cognition can be given. The postulate of the possibility of things requires also that the conception of the things agree with the formal conditions of our experience in general. But this, that is to say the objective form of experience, contains all the kinds of synthesis which are requisite for the cognition of objects conception which contains a synthesis must be regarded as empty and, without reference to an object, if its synthesis does not belong to experience, either is borrowed from it and, in this case, it is called an empirical conception, or such as is the ground in a priori condition of experience, parentheses its form, and parentheses, and in this case it is a pure conception, a conception which nevertheless belongs to experience inasmuch as its object can be found in this alone. For where shall we find the criterion or character of a possibility of an object which is cogitated by means of an a priori synthetical conception, if not in the synthesis which constitutes the form of empirical cognition of objects? That in such a conception no contradiction exists is indeed a necessary logical condition, but very far from being sufficient to establish the objective reality of the conception, that is the possibility of such an object as is thought in the conception. Thus, in the conception of a figure which is contained within two straight lines, there is no contradiction, for the conceptions of two straight lines and of their junction contain no negation of a figure. The impossibility in such a case does not rest upon the conception in itself, but upon the construction of it in space, that is to say, upon the conditions of space and its determinations. But these have themselves objective reality, that is, they apply to possible things, because they contain a priori the form of experience in general. And now we shall proceed to point out the extensive utility and influence of this postulate of possibility. 
When I represent to myself the thing that is permanent, so that everything in it which changes belongs merely to its state or condition, from such a conception alone I never can cognize that such a thing is possible. Or, if I represent to myself something which is so constituted that, when it is posited, something else follows always and infallibly, my thought contains no self-contradiction. But whether such a property as causality is to be found in any possible thing, my thought alone affords no mean of judging. Finally, I can represent to myself different things, parens, substances, and parens, which are so constituted that the state or condition of one causes a change in the state of the other, and reciprocally. But whether such a relation is a property of things cannot be perceived from these conceptions, which contain merely arbitrary synthesis. Only from the fact, therefore, that these conceptions express a priori the relations of perceptions in every experience, do we know that they possess objective reality, that is, transcendental truth. And that independent of experience, though not independent of all relation to form of an experience in general and its synthetic unity, in which alone objects can be empirically cognized. But when we fashion to ourselves new conception of substances, forces, action, and reaction from the material presented to us by perception, without following the example of experience in their connection, we create mere chimeras of the possibility of which we cannot discover any criterion because we have not taken experience for unstructurous, although we have borrowed the conceptions from her. Such fictitious conceptions derive their character of possibility not, like the categories, a priori, as conceptions on which all experience depends, but only a posteriori, as conceptions given by means of experience itself, and their possibility must either be cognized a posteriori and empirically, or it cannot be cognized at all. A substance which is permanently present in space, yet without filling it, friends, like that tertium quid between matter and the thinking subject which some have tried to introduce into metaphysics, close parens, or a peculiar fundamental power of the mind of intuiting the future by anticipation, parens, instead of merely inferring from past and present events, and parens, or finally, a power of the mind to place itself in community of thought with other men, however distant they may be. These are conceptions the possibility of which has no ground to rest upon. For they are not based upon experience and its known laws, and without experience, they are merely arbitrary conjunction of thoughts, which though containing no internal contradiction, has no claim to objective reality, neither consequently to the possibility of such an object as is thought in these conceptions. As far as concerns reality, it is self-evident that we cannot cogitate such a possibility in concreto without the aid of experience, because reality is concerned only with sensation as the matter of experience and not with the form of thought with which we can no doubt indulge in shaping fancies. But I pass by everything which derives its possibility from reality and experience, and I purpose treating here merely of the possibility of things by means of a priori conceptions. I maintain, then, that the possibility of things is not derived from such conceptions per se, but only when considered as formal and objective conditions of an experience in general. It seems, indeed, as if the possibility of a triangle could be cognized from the conception of it alone, parens, which is certainly independent of experience, and parens, for we can certainly give to the conception a corresponding object completely a priori, that is to say, we can construct it. But as a triangle is only the form of an object, it must remain a mere product of the imagination, and the possibility of the existence of an object corresponding to it must remain doubtful unless we can discover some other ground unless we know that the figure can be cogitated under conditions upon which all objects of experience rest. Now, the fact that space is a formal condition a priori of external experience, that the formative synthesis by which we construct a triangle in imagination is the very same that we employ in the apprehension of a phenomenon for the purpose of making an empirical conception of it, are what alone connect the notion of the possibility of such a thing with the conception of it. In the same manner, the possibility of continuous quantities, indeed of quantities in general, for the conceptions of them are without exception synthetical, is never evident from the conceptions themselves, but only when they are considered as the formal conditions of the determination of objects in experience. And where indeed should we look for objects to correspond to our conceptions, if not in experience, 
by which alone objects are presented to us. It is, however, true that without antecedent experience, we can cognize and characterize the possibility of things relatively to the formal conditions under which something is determined in experience as an object, consequently completely a priori. But still this is possible only in relation to experience and within its limits. The postulate concerning the cognition of the reality of things requires perception, consequently conscious sensation, not indeed immediately, that is, of the object itself, whose existence is to be cognized, but still that the object have some connection with a real perception, in accordance with the analogies of experience, which exhibit all kinds of real connection and experience. From the mere conception of a thing, it is impossible to conclude its existence. For, let the conception be ever so complete, and containing a statement of all the determinations of the thing, the existence of it has nothing to do with all this, but only with the question whether such a thing is given, so that the perception of it can in every case precede the conception. For the fact that the conception of it precedes the perception merely indicates the possibility of its existence. It is perception which presents matter to the conception that is the sole criterion of reality. Prior to the perception of the thing, however, and therefore comparatively a priori, we are able to cognize its existence provided it stands in connection with some perceptions according to the principles of the empirical conjunction of these, that is, in conformity with the analogies of perception. For in this case, the existence of the supposed thing is connected with our perception in a possible experience, and we are able, with the guidance of these analogies, to reason in the series of possible perceptions from a thing which we do really perceive to the thing that we do not perceive. Thus, we cognize the existence of a magnetic matter penetrating all bodies from the perception of the attraction of the steel filings by the magnet. Although, the constitution of our organs render an immediate perception of this matter impossible for us. For according to the laws of sensibility, in the connected context of our perceptions, we should in experience come also on immediate empirical intuition of this matter, if our senses were more acute. But this obtuseness has no influence upon and cannot alter the form of possible experience in general. Our knowledge of the existence of things reaches as far as our perceptions, and what may be inferred from them according to empirical laws extend. If we do not set out from experience, or do not proceed according to the laws of the empirical connection of phenomenon, our pretensions to discover the existence of a thing which we do not immediately perceive are vain. Idealism, however, brings forward powerful objections to these rules for proving existence immediately. This is, therefore, the proper place for its refutation. Refutation of Idealism Idealism, I mean material idealism, is the theory which declares the existence of objects in space without us to be either 1. doubtful and indemonstrable or 2. false and impossible. The first is the problematic idealism of Descartes, who admits the undoubted certainty of only one empirical assertion, parentheses assertio and parens to wit, I am. The second is the dogmatical idealism of Berkeley, who maintains that space, together with all the objects of which it is the inseparable condition, is a thing which is in itself impossible, and that consequently, the objects in space are mere products of the imagination. The dogmatical theory of idealism is unavoidable if we regard space as the property of things in themselves, for in that case it is, with all to which it serves as condition, a non-entity. But the foundation for this kind of idealism we have already destroyed in the transcendental aesthetic. Problematical idealism, which makes no such assertion, but only alleges our incapacity to prove the existence of anything besides ourselves by means of immediate experience, is a theory rational and evidencing a thorough and philosophical mode of thinking, for it observes the rule not to form a decisive judgment before sufficient proof be shown. The desired proof must therefore demonstrate that we have experience of external things, and not mere fancies. For this purpose, we must prove that our internal and, to Descartes, indubitable experience is itself possible only under the previous assumption of external experience. Theorem 
The simple but empirically determined consciousness of my own existence proves the existence of external objects in space. Proof I am conscious of my own existence as determined in time. All determination in regard to time presupposes the existence of something permanent in perception. But this permanent something cannot be something in me, for the very reason that my existence in time is itself determined by this permanent something. It follows that the perception of this permanent existence is possible only through a thing without me, and not through the mere representation of a thing without me. Consequently, the determination of my existence in time is possible only through the existence of real things external to me. Now, consciousness in time is necessarily connected with the consciousness of the possibility of this determination in time. Hence, it follows that consciousness in time is necessarily connected also with the existence of things without me, inasmuch as the existence of these things is the condition of determination in time. That is to say, the consciousness of my own existence is at the same time an immediate consciousness of the existence of other things without me. Remark 1. The reader will observe that in the foregoing proof the game which idealism plays is retorted upon itself, and with more justice. It assumed that only immediate experience is internal, and that from this we can only infer the existence of external things. But, as always happens when we reason from given effects to determine causes, idealism is reasoned with too much haste and uncertainty. For it is quite possible that the cause of our representations may lie in ourselves and that we ascribe it falsely to external things. But our proof shows that external experience is properly immediate, that only by virtue of it, not indeed the consciousness of our own existence, but certainly the determination of our existence in time, that is, internal experience, is possible. Footnote. The immediate consciousness of the existence of external things is, in the preceding theorem, not presupposed but proved by the possibility of this consciousness understood by us or not. The question as to the possibility of it would stand thus, quote, have we an internal sense but no external sense, and is our belief in external perceptions a mere delusion? But it is evident that in order to merely fancy to ourselves anything is external, that is to present it to the sense and intuition we must already possess an external sense, and must thereby distinguish immediately the mere receptivity of an external intuition from the spontaneity which characterizes every act of imagination. For merely to imagine also an external sense would annihilate the faculty of intuition itself, which is to be determined by the imagination. End footnote. It is true that the representation, quote, I am, end quote, which is the expression of the consciousness which can accompany all my thoughts, is that which immediately includes the existence of a subject. But in this representation, we cannot find any knowledge of the subject, and therefore also no empirical knowledge, that is experience. For experience contains, in addition to the thought of something existing, intuition, and in this case must be internal intuition, that is time, in relation to which the subject must be determined. But the existence of external things is absolutely requisite for this purpose, so that it follows that internal experience is itself possible only immediately and through external experience. Remark 2. Now with this view, all empirical use of our faculty of cognition in the determination of time is in perfect accordance. Its truth is supported by the fact that it is possible to perceive a determination of time only by means of a change in external relations, parens motion, and parens, to the permanent in space, parens. For example, we become aware of the sun's motion by observing the changes of his relation to the objects of this earth, and parens, period. But that is not all. We find that we possess nothing permanent that can correspond and be submitted to the conception of a substance as intuition, except matter. This idea of permanence is not itself derived from external experience, but is an a priori necessary condition of all determination of time, consequently also of the internal sense in reference to our own existence, and that through the existence of external things. In the representation, quote, I, the consciousness of myself is not an intuition, but a merely intellectual representation produced by the spontaneous activity of a thinking subject. It follows that this I has not any predicate of intuition, which, in its character of permanence, could serve as the correlate to the determination of time in the internal sense, in the same way as impenetrability is the correlate of matter as an empirical intuition. Remark 3. 
From the fact that the existence of external things is a necessary condition to the possibility of a determined consciousness of ourselves, it does not follow that every intuitive representation of external things involves the existence of these things, for the representations may very well be the mere products of the imagination, parens, in dreams as well as in madness, and parens, though indeed these are themselves created by the reproduction of previous external perceptions, which, as has been shown, are possible only through the reality of external objects. The sole aim of our remarks has, however, been to prove that internal experience in general is possible only through the external experience in general. Whether this or that supposed experience be purely imaginary must be discovered from its particular determinations and by comparing these with the criteria of all real experience. Finally, as regards the third postulate, it applies to material necessity in existence and not to merely formal and logical necessity in the connection of conceptions. Now, as we cannot cognize completely a priori the existence of any object of sense, though we can do so comparatively a priori, that is, relatively to some other previously given existence, a cognition, however, which can only be of such an existence as must be contained in the complex of experience, of which the previously given perception is a part, the necessity of existence can never be cognized from conceptions, but always, on the contrary, from its connection with that which is an object of perception the only existence cognized under the condition of other given phenomena unnecessary is the existence of effects from given causes in conformity with the laws of causality. It is consequently not the necessity of the existence of things, open parens, as substances, and parens, but the necessity of the state of things that we cognize, and that not immediately, but by means of the existence of other states given in perception, according to empirical laws of causality. Hence it follows that the criterion of necessity is to be found only in the law of possible experience, that everything which happens is determined a priori in the phenomena by its cause. Thus we cognize only the necessity of effects in nature, the causes of which are given us. Moreover, the criterion of necessity in existence possesses no application beyond the field of possible experience, and even in this it is not valid of the existence of things as substances, because these can never be considered as empirical effects or something that happens and has a beginning. Necessity, therefore, regards only the relations of phenomena according to the dynamical law of causality, and the possible ground thereon, of reasoning from some given existence open parens, of a cause close parens, a priori to another existence open parens, of an effect close parens. Quote, Everything that happens is hypothetically necessary, is a principle which subjects the changes that take place in the world to a law, that is, to a rule of necessary existence, without which nature herself could not possibly exist. Hence the proposition, quote, nothing happens by blind chance, friends, in mundo non deturcasus, end quote, is an a priori law of nature. The case is the same with the proposition, quote, necessity in nature is not blind, end quote. That is, it is condition, consequently intelligible necessity, Open parens, non dater fardum, close parens. Both laws subject the play of change to, quote, a nature of things, open parens, as phenomena, close parens, close quote, or, which is the same thing, to the unity of the understanding, and through the understanding alone can changes belong to an experience, as a synthetical unity of phenomena. Both belong to the class of dynamical principles. The former is properly a consequence of the principle of causality, one of the analogies of experience. The latter belongs to the principles of modality, which to the determination of causality adds the conception of necessity, which is itself, however, subject to a rule of the understanding. The principle of continuity forbids any leap in the series of phenomena regarded as changes, friends, in mundo non dutter saltus, close friends, and likewise, in the complex of all empirical intuitions in space, any break or hiatus between two phenomena, open friends, non dater hiatus, close friends, for we can so express the principle that the experience can admit nothing which proves the existence of a vacuum, or which even admits it as part of an empirical synthesis. For, as regards a vacuum or void, which we may cogitate as out and beyond the field of possible experience, parens the world, close parens, such a question cannot come before the tribunal of mere understanding, which decides only upon questions that concern the employment of given phenomena for the construction of empirical cognition. It is rather a problem for ideal reason, 
which passes beyond the sphere of a possible experience and aims at forming a judgment of that which surrounds and circumscribes it, and the proper place for the consideration of it is the transcendental dialectic. These four propositions, quote, in mundo non deter hiatus, non deter saltus, non deter calcis, non deter fatum, end quote, as well as all principles of transcendental origin, we could very easily exhibit in their proper order, that is, in conformity with the order of categories, and assign to each its proper place. But the already practiced reader will do this for himself, or discover the clue to such an arrangement. But the combined result of all is simply this, to understanding and the continuous connection of all phenomena, that is, the unity of conception with the understanding. For in the understanding alone is the unity of experience, in which all perceptions must have their assigned place possible. Whether the field of possibility be greater than that of reality, and whether the field of the latter be itself greater than that of necessity, are interesting enough questions and quite capable of synthetic solution, questions, however, which come under the jurisdiction of reason alone. For they are tantamount to asking whether all things as phenomena do without exception belong to the complex and connected whole of a single experience, of which every given perception is a part and which therefore cannot be conjoined with any other phenomenon, or whether my perceptions can belong to more than one possible experience. The understanding gives to experience, according to the subjective and formal conditions of sensibility as well as per a perception, the rules which alone make this experience possible. Other forms of intuition besides those of space and time, other forms of understanding besides discursive forms of thought, or of cognition by means of conception, we can neither imagine nor make intelligible to ourselves. And even if we could, they would still not belong to experience, which is the only mode of cognition by which objects are presented to us. Whether our perceptions besides those which belong to the total of our possible experience, and consequently, whether some other sphere of matter exists, the understanding has no power to decide, its proper occupation being with the synthesis of that which is given. Moreover, the poverty of the usual arguments would go to prove the existence of a vast sphere of possibility, of which all that is real, parentheses, every object of experience, and parens, is but a small part, is very remarkable. Quote, all real is possible, end quote. From this follows naturally, according to the logical laws of conversion, the particular proposition, quote, some possible, is real, close quote. Now this seems to be equivalent to, quote, much is possible that is not real, end quote. No doubt it does seem as if we ought to consider the sum of the possible to be greater than that of the real, from the fact that something must be added to the former that constitute the latter. But this notion of adding to the possible is absurd. For that which is not in the sum of the possible, and consequently requires to be added to it, is manifestly impossible. In addition to accordance with the formal conditions of experience, the understanding requires a connection with some perception. But that which is connected with this perception is real, even although it is not immediately perceived. But that another series of phenomena, in complete coherence with that which is given in perception, consequently more than one all-embracing experience is possible is an inference which cannot be concluded from the data given to us by experience, and still less without any data at all. That which is possible only under conditions which are themselves merely possible, is not possible in any respect. And yet, we can find no more certain ground on which to base the discussion of the question whether the sphere of possibility is wider than that of experience. I have merely mentioned these questions that in treating of the conception of the understanding there might be no omission of anything that, in the common opinion, belongs to them. In reality, however, the notion of absolute possibility parentheses, possibility which is valid in every respect close parens, is not a mere conception of the understanding which can be employed empirically, but belongs to reason alone, which passes the bounds of all empirical use of the understanding. We have, therefore, contented ourselves with a merely critical remark, leaving the subject to be explained in the sequel. Before concluding this fourth section, and at the same time the system of all principles of pure understanding, it seems proper to mention the reasons which induced me to term the principles of modality postulates. 
This expression I do not here use in the sense which some more recent philosophers, contrary to its meaning with mathematicians, to whom the word properly belongs, attach to it, that of a proposition namely immediately certain requiring neither deduction nor proof. For, if, in the case of synthetical propositions, however evident they may be, we accord to them without deduction, and merely on the strength of their own pretensions, unqualified belief, all critique of the understanding is entirely lost. And, as there is no want of bold pretensions, which the common belief, parens, though for philosopher this is no credential, and parens, does not reject, the understanding lies exposed to every delusion and conceit, without the power of refusing its assent to those assertions, which, though illegitimate, demand acceptance as veritable axioms. When, therefore, to the conception of a thing an a priori determination is synthetically added, such a proposition must obtain, if not proof, at least a deduction of the legitimacy of its assertion. The principles modality are, however, not objectively synthetical, for the predicates of possibility, reality, and necessity do not in the least augment the conception of that of which they are affirmed, inasmuch as they contribute nothing to the representation of the object. But as they are nevertheless always synthetical, they are so merely subjectively. That is to say, they have a reflective power, and apply to the conception of a thing of which in other respects they affirm nothing, the faculty of cognition in which the conception originates and has its seat. So that if the conception merely agree with the formal conditions of experience, its object is called possible. If it is connection with perception, and determined thereby, the object is real. If it is determined according to conceptions by means of the connection of perceptions, the object is called necessary. The principles of modality therefore predicate of a conception nothing more than the procedure of the faculty of cognition which generated it. Now a postulate in mathematics is a practical proposition which contains nothing but the synthesis by which we present an object to ourselves, and produce the conception of it, for example, quote, with a given line to describe a circle upon a plane from a given point, end quote. And such a proposition does not admit of proof because the procedure which it requires is exactly that by which alone it is possible to generate the conception of such a figure. With the same right, accordingly, can we postulate the principles of modality, because they do not augment the conception of a thing, but merely indicate the manner in which it is connected with the faculty of cognition. Footnote. When I think the reality of a thing, I do really think more than the possibility, but not in the thing, for that can never contain more in reality that was contained in its complete possibility. But while the notion of possibility is merely the notion of a position of thing in relation to the understanding, parens, its empirical use, and parens, reality is the conjunction of the thing with perception. End footnote. General Remark on the System of Principles It is very remarkable that we cannot perceive the possibility of a thing from the category alone but must always have an intuition by which to make evident the objective reality of the pure conception of the understanding. Take, for example, the categories of relation. How, one, a thing can exist only as a subject and not as a mere determination of other things, that is, can be the substance. Or how, two, because something exists, some other thing must exist, consequently how a thing can be a cause. Or how, three, when several things exist, from the fact that one of these things exists, some consequence to the others follows, and reciprocally, and in this way, a community of substances can be possible, are questions whose solution cannot be obtained from mere conceptions. The very same is the case with the other categories. For example, how a thing can be of the same sort with many others, that is, can be a quantity and so on. So long as we have not intuition, we cannot know whether we do really think an object by the categories, and where an object can be anywhere found to cohere with them, and thus the truth is established that the categories are not in themselves cognitions, but mere forms of thought for the construction of cognitions from given intuitions. For the same reason, it is true that from categories alone, no synthetical proposition can be made. For example, quote, in every existence there is substance, end quote. That is, something that can exist only as a subject and not as a mere predicate, or, quote, everything is a quantity, end quote, to construct propositions such as these, we require something to enable us to go out beyond the given conception and connect another with it. 
For the same reason, the attempt to prove a synthetical proposition by means of a mere conceptions, for example, quote, everything that exists contingently has a cause, end quote, has never succeeded. We could never get further than proving that, without this relation to conceptions, we could not conceive the existence of the contingent, that is, could not a priori through the understanding cognize the existence of such a thing. But it does not hence follow that this is also the condition of the possibility of the thing itself that is said to be contingent. If, accordingly, we look back to our proof the principle of causality, we shall find that we were able to prove it is valid only of objects of possible experience, and indeed, only as itself the principle of the possibility of experience, consequently of the cognition of an object given an empirical intuition and not from mere conceptions. That, however, the proposition, quote, everything that is contingent must have a cause, end quote, is evident to every one merely from conceptions, is not to be denied. But in this case, the conception of the contingent is cogitated as involving not the category of modality, parens, as the non-existence of which can be conceived, close parens, but that of relation, parens, as that which can exist only as the consequence of something else, close parens. And so it is really an identical proposition, quote, that which can exist only as a consequence has a cause, end quote. In fact, when we have to give examples of contingent existence, we always refer to changes, and not merely to the possibility of conceiving the opposite. Footnote. We can easily conceive the non-existence of matter, but the ancients did not thence infer its contingency. But even the alternation of the existence and non-existence of a giving state in the thing in which all change consists, by no means proved the contingency of that state, the ground of proof being the reality of its opposite. For example, a body is in a state of rest after motion, but we cannot infer the contingency of the motion from the fact that the former is opposite to the latter, for this opposite is merely a logical and not a real opposite to the other. If we wish to demonstrate the contingency of motion, that we ought to prove is that instead of the motion which took place in the preceding point of time, it was possible for the body to have been then in rest, not that it is afterwards in rest. For in this case, both opposites are perfectly consistent with each other. End footnote. But change is an event which, as such, is possible only through a cause, and considered per se, its non-existence is therefore possible, and we become cognizant of a contingency from the fact that it can exist only as the effect of a cause. Hence, if a thing is assumed to be contingent, it is an analytical proposition to say it has a cause. But it is still more remarkable that, to understand the possibility of things according to the categories, and thus to demonstrate the objective reality of the latter, we require not merely intuitions, but external intuitions. If, for example, we take the pure conceptions of relation, we find that 1. For the purpose of presenting to the conception of substance something permanent in intuition corresponding thereto, and thus of demonstrating the objective reality of this conception, we require an intuition open parens, of matter, close parens, and space, because space alone is permanent and determines things as such, while time, and with it all that is in the internal sense, is in a state of continual flow. 2. In order to represent change as the intuition corresponding to the conception of causality, we require the representation of motion as change in space. In fact, it is through it alone that changes, the possibility of which no pure understanding can perceive are capable of being intuited. Change is the connection of determinations contradictorily opposed to each other in the existence of one and the same thing. Now, how is it possible that out of a given state, one quite opposite to it and the same thing should follow? Reason, without an example, can not only not conceive, but cannot even make intelligible without intuition. And this intuition is the motion of a point in space, the existence of which, in different spaces, friends, as a consequent of opposite determinations, close friends, alone makes the intuition of change possible. For, in order to make even internal change cognitable, we require to represent time as the form of the internal sense, figuratively by a line, and the internal change by the drawing of that line, open friends, motion, close friends, and consequently are obliged to employ external intuition to be able to represent the successive existence of ourselves in different states. The proper ground of this fact is that all change to be perceived as change presupposes something permanent in intuition, while in the internal sense no permanent intuition is to be found. 
Lastly, the objective possibility of the category of community cannot be conceived by mere reason, and consequently its objective reality cannot be demonstrated without an intuition, and that external in space. For how can we conceive the possibility of community, that is, when several substances exist, that some effect on the existence of the one follows from the existence of the other, and reciprocally, and therefore that, because something exists in the latter, something else must exist in the former, which cannot be understood from its own existence alone? For this is the very essence of community, which is inconceivable as a property of things which are perfectly isolated. Hence, Leibniz, in attributing to the substance of the world, as cogitated by the understanding alone, a community, required the mediating aid of a divinity. For from their existence, such a property seemed to him with justice inconceivable. But we can very easily conceive the possibility of community, friends of substances as phenomena and friends, if we represent them to ourselves as in space, consequently in external intuition. For external intuition contains in itself a priori formal external relations as the conditions of the possibility of the real relations of action and reaction, and therefore of the possibility of community. With the same ease can it be demonstrated that the possibility of things as quantities and consequently the objective reality of the category of quantity can be grounded only in external intuition and that by its means alone is the notion of quantity appropriated by the internal sense. But I must avoid prolixity and leave the task of illustrating this by examples to the reader's own reflection. The above remarks are of the greatest importance, not only for the confirmation of our previous confutation of idealism, but still more when the subject of self-cognition by mere internal consciousness and the determination of our own nature without the aid of external empirical intuitions is under discussion, for the indication of the grounds of the possibility of such a cognition. The result of the whole of this part of the analytic principles is therefore, quote, all principles of the pure understanding are nothing more than a priori principles of the possibility of experience, and to experience alone do all a priori synthetical propositions apply and relate." End quote. Indeed, their possibility itself rests entirely on this relation.